This is Audible. Highbridge, a division of recorded books, presents In Europe's Shadow Two Cold Wars and a Thirty Year Journey Through Romania and Beyond by Robert D. Kaplan. Read by Paul Bamer. Who remembering or foreseeing ever smiled? Fernando Pessoa, 1926. True experience consists in reducing one's contact with reality, whilst at the same time intensifying one's analysis of that contact. Fernando Pessoa, 1935. Prologue. Nabokov's Room. My library is a burden. It constitutes the notes that I am afraid to lose until I make use of them. So I need to write all this down. That way I can discard my library and continue to strip away my possessions. The foremost indignity of old age. One book means freedom. Too many books, though, act as a barrier to further discovery of the world. When you have a ready quote in your head for every new vista before your eyes, you can no longer see clearly. Hardcovers are for sedentary life. I have relatively few of those, and even fewer first editions. No bibliophile would be impressed. My library mainly consists of battered paperbacks scrawled over with notes that I've made over the years. Nevertheless, each one is precious to me. A low budget makes you savor individual books and makes you discerning as to which ones to buy. I did not have a full-time job until I was fifty-three. Then I had several in succession, sometimes simultaneously. So, in middle age, I started to accumulate many more books which individually meant less and less to me. It is the books I acquired decades ago that really matter. Like old friends with whom you have lost touch, as flawed as they are, you can't shake your memory of them. The problem is that like old memories overtaken by more recent ones, the objects so dear to me have gotten pushed behind the stacks. The icon given to me by a Romanian artist which once held such a prominent place, is now squeezed sideways between a book on the Balkans and a Cambodian statue, behind which, in turn, is a print I bought at a museum in Lahore almost a lifetime ago. I must tear all this away. Beware the narcissism of collecting. But it is hard. One worthy paperback beside the bed civilizes even the crassest, hotel room. Sir Ronald Storrs, British governor of Cyprus, wrote after a mob burned down his library in 1931 that even objects commonly called inanimate, over which one has mused often and long, may become almost like those beloved beings that no seeming death can ever take. I can still shut my eyes and feel each book standing in its place. This from one of the handful of first editions I do own. The most sensuous, inanimate object is a book. I hold in my hands a 1977 Hutchinson paperback of C. R. Boxer's The Portuguese Seaborne Empire, 1415 to 1825, originally published in 1969, a holy text for those enamored by things Portuguese. I stare at its cover, the top half an elegant black-and-white typeface, the bottom half a painting of a caravel in a rich and turbulent turquoise sea set against a map. This paperback has the texture of a medieval vase. For decades I began each new project with the purchase of a beautiful book on the subject, illustrated paperback editions of Alan Moorhead's The White Nile, 1960, and the Blue Nile, 1962, for a book 
on the Horn of Africa. The Oxford University Press Karachi edition of Olaf Karo's The Patans, 1958, for a book on Afghanistan, a first edition of John Reed's The War in Eastern Europe, 1916, a rare splurge, for a book on the Balkans, the Charles E. Laureate Company edition of Basil Lubbock's The Opium Clippers, 1933, another splurge, for a book on the Indian Ocean, and so on. Books that have been owned by someone for many years for a specific purpose carry not just memories, that is obvious, they also reveal their owner's true values, for the books we own may indicate something about us very different from what we think. But don't wholly discount the value of memories that books confer. A book can connote the place where it was read better than an old photograph can. For me, Budenbrooks summons forth Prague in the early winter of 1981, when the Cold War granted a debilitating silence to the city, so that the squares were empty, making the statues and gargoyles all the more formidable. I remember returning from an interview with an official of the Communist government, being followed by a secret policeman to my hotel, and then reading in my hotel room about the little house on the Mecklenburg coast that smelled of coffee, where Antonia Budenbrook develops an affection for a young medical student, a romance that dies with the summer because of family obligations. My copy of Fathers and Sons, which I read while I stayed alone in a lodge during two days of rainstorms in the summer of 1973, summons forth a Romanian forest of oak, fir, and beech. Because of Turgenev's dark, modern message embedded in a pastoral romance about nineteenth-century Russia, I experienced solitude rather than loneliness in Romania. Young people are blessed by the ability to live in the present. Those in middle age and beyond, undone by anxieties, are desperate to retrieve it. Books are an act of resistance, not just to the distractions of the electronic age, but to our problems and to our pretensions. The goal is not success, but presentness, to recover those long moments, hours on end actually, of absolute concentration in Turgenev's story. Turgenev took me inside the iciest of hearts, as it is crushed by passion so that I comprehended for the first time how ideology, with all its abstractions, founders on Shakespearean depths. Like old records, old paperback books are quaint and delicious at first, but as the years roll on they threaten to assume the look of junk in an attic. Musty, yellowing pages will not do in a liquid crystal age. Get rid of books! I tell myself. Keep only the ones that matter most. Thin out my library. Reduce it to the essentials. There is a short story by Vladimir Nobokov, Cloud, Castle, Lake. The protagonist is desperate to escape from a noisy tour group, to escape from a world, really, that demands a horrific conformity. He happens upon an inn, Upstairs was a room for travellers. You know, I shall take it for the rest of my life, he tells the innkeeper. It was a most ordinary room, but from the window one could clearly see the lake with its cloud and its castle, in a motionless and perfect correlation of happiness. He realises, in one radiant second, that here, in this little room, with that view, beautiful to the verge of tears, life would at last be what he had always wished it to be. He would require only a few possessions to fill that room, including a few books. What would be the books, two dozen at the most, enough for a shelf, that I would bring to such a room in order to live out the rest of my life? 
Each of these books would have to hold deep meaning for me, to have changed me, to have pivotally affected my life, and not altogether for the better. For life to be life requires complications, and even unpleasantness. Indeed, I have the books in mind that I would choose. Here is only the story of one. I pull a battered volume off one of my shelves, The Governments of Communist East Europe by H. Gordon Skilling, the 1971 paperback edition. The book was originally published in 1966. I turn it over with affection. The title is dry, academic, and the cover is likewise, all grey with a brown heading and no picture. There is nothing here of aesthetic or literary merit. This book, unlike the one about the Portuguese Empire, is not beautiful. But this would be among the books I would take to Nabokov's imaginary room. I was walking down King George Street in Jerusalem in the late summer of 1981. The sunlight was harsh, oppressive. I was tired and sweaty and had a mild headache, wandering aimlessly, until I noticed a bookshop in an area roughly parallel by a few blocks to the King David Hotel. It was a little dusty warehouse with grey metal shelves and no place to sit, and little arrangement to the books. Like the walk I took, my life at that moment was directionless. I would be released from the Israel Defense Forces, IDF, in a few weeks, and was not sure what to do next. I was twenty-nine. I lacked a degree from the kind of college that helps in the world of journalism. I had worked as a freelance journalist in parts of the Arab world and Israel, and had read and travelled voraciously, but all to little published effect. In Israel, for a few years, I had become fascinated not only with the country itself, but with the Holy Land and its tapestry of different religions. I had acquired a passion not only for synagogues, but for Greek monasteries in the Judean desert, and for medieval Muslim monuments. That had led me to write and ghostwrite a number of illustrated books on archaeology and Orthodox Christianity for Israeli publishers that had a negligible circulation. In short, I was basically unemployable. Moreover, I felt suffocated by my life in Jerusalem and just wanted to travel once again. The fact that I picked the governments of Communist East Europe off a shelf the moment I saw it was not accidental, even if finding the book at that moment certainly was. The author, H. Gordon Skilling, was a Canadian expert on Cold War Eastern Europe of considerable note, who taught at the University of Toronto, from where he supported anti-communist dissidents. He had a particular interest in what was then Czechoslovakia, about which he had essentially written its twentieth-century history. But I knew nothing of this at the time. For me, he was just a name on a drab, cheaply priced book. I decided to have a look at the book, because it stirred a recollection. In the summer of 1971 I had travelled by train for a few days through Yugoslavia. Inspired by that brief visit, upon graduation from college I made a three-month journey through Communist Europe, in the summer of 1973, starting in East Germany and continuing through Poland and Czechoslovakia, and then southeast through Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. I stayed at youth hostels and in the homes of people I met along the way. This was during the height of the Cold War, when all these countries were lumped together by the Western media into one grey mass as the satellite states of the Soviet Union. But as soon as I arrived in Warsaw from East Berlin, I began to notice vast differences between the various countries and how they were ruled. Whereas East Germany was a locked-down prison state, Poland had a much more liberalized atmosphere, and whereas Hungary, like Poland, was seething with convivial youth, with whom it was easy for me to make friends,
Romania next door was far poorer and closed off to a Western visitor. I could strike up a friendship with no one there. Finally, there was Bulgaria, in whose countryside I felt I had left Europe altogether for what I then imagined to be the Middle East. Nothing came of that 1973 trip. My attempts at publishing dispatches had failed because of my own inadequacy as a writer, and insufficient interest, perhaps, in a region where there was so little news at the time. Returning to the United States, I found a job at a small newspaper and saved enough money to resume traveling, this time through the Arab world, ending up in Israel with no clear purpose. I was terrified of wasting my life. Leaning against the metal shelves in the dusty bookstore, I began to read Skilling's narrative. On page five, I was roused by the realization that Great Britain's and France's policy of appeasement toward Hitler's Germany in the 1930s had damaged the reputation of the West in Eastern Europe even before World War II, an era when for significant periods it was mainly the Communists who were associated with standing up to the Nazis. Thus, the loss of Eastern Europe to Stalin had its roots in Chamberlain's pact with Hitler at Munich in 1938. On page 7, I realized it was the disunity of the Eastern European states themselves that had facilitated the Soviet Union's conquest and continued hold over the region. Disunity between the satellite states had been my own impression of Eastern Europe eight years earlier. Too tired to continue reading in the store, I bought the book and took it back to my loft in Jerusalem's Musrara neighborhood, near the old city. Over the next few days, Skilling revealed to me a world of intense national conflict, internal political weakness, sharply defined geographical regions cutting one group off from the other but all easy to penetrate by an outside power, be it Habsburg Austria in previous centuries, or the Soviet Union in this one. The Danube Plain had been a route for migrating peoples and invading armies. Over a dozen nationalities form an ethnic mosaic as varied as the geography. Though the Slavs were mainly Asiatic, cultural kinship never transformed into political unity. Inter-Slav and Slav-Non-Slav conflict grew from different religious traditions and experiences of occupation. I am transcribing the shorthand notes I made in the back of what was at the time already a decade-old paperback. Religion never caused unity because the Orthodox churches were autocephalous. Besides, there was the Catholic-Protestant rift. Of course, there was, too, the division between Catholics and Orthodox, harking back to that between Rome and Byzantium. On reading the word Orthodox in Skilling's book, my mind reeled at the connections with the Greek monasteries I often visited in the midst of the Judean desert, glittering, musky enclosures, teeming with icons and egg tempera frescoes surrounded by a fiery, pie-crust landscape, scorched the color of zinc. Democracy, Skilling went on, had sunk meager roots in these countries between the two world wars. World War II had created ethnic winners and losers on a grand scale in Eastern Europe, and since 1945, history had virtually stopped. Meanwhile, the Romanians and the Albanians were still in significant measure peasants. Thus did Skilling's explanation partly account for my shock of how Romania looked and felt in 1973, compared to Hungary. I stared for minutes on end at the ethnic map on page 13, so unlike the Cold War maps with which I was vaguely familiar. Like the most valuable perceptions, the nub of a plan can formulate in your mind in the fraction of a second. Israel, 
though diplomatically isolated from the Warsaw Pact, did have formal relations with communist Romania, and more crucially for my purposes, it had a direct air link to the capital of Bucharest. The very day after I was released from the military, I decided that I would fly to Romania and begin a journey throughout Eastern Europe. I had saved some money from ghostwriting. This time, I told myself, I would not waste the opportunity. This trip, with Skilling's book as my guide, would be specifically about selling articles to newspapers in order to establish the basis of a resume. Eastern Europe, in 1981, particularly the Balkans, was a journalistic backwater in the extreme. Skilling's classification of the rugged and mountainous Balkan Peninsula, forming one of three sub-regions within communist Eastern Europe, the others being the North European and Danubian plains, gave prominence to an era, and a word even, absent from the headlines for decades on end. The Balkans, at that moment, represented the opposite of Israel and the Middle East. Rather than scores of journalists chasing after the same story, as was the case in Jerusalem, and attending the same press conferences, here was a region within Europe itself, with almost no one covering it, a region that was just as historically and culturally interesting as where I lived at the moment. Skilling's suggestion at the end of his book that all these states remained distinctive in their own right, despite their inclusion inside the Soviet Empire, with each practicing communism in its own way, according to its own culture and historical experience, would constitute a theme of my reporting, I decided. It is the perceived differences between us, as much as the similarities, that make us human. I began to scan the press for anything about Eastern Europe, and especially the Balkans, and explored the newspaper microfilm archives at the Library of the United States Information Center in West Jerusalem. A pattern quickly emerged. A number of the major news organizations had correspondents in Warsaw or Vienna, who once a year or so in the late 1970s and early 1980s would make a journey through the southern tier of communist Eastern Europe, writing a story about Yugoslavia a story about Romania, and so on. I found a number of stories about how the Romanian currency was so worthless, people used Kent cigarettes as barter. While this was interesting, I got tired of reading the very same story from one correspondent after another. Surely more was going on in the country than that. Finally, a wire service story at the bottom of an inside page of the Jerusalem Post caught my interest. The dateline was Belgrade, the Yugoslav capital. Apparently, the Soviet Union was reducing the subsidy on fuel it provided the Eastern European states, resulting in periodic power blackouts throughout the region. I couldn't know it at the time, but this marked the beginning of a decade of economic decline that would eventually help ignite unrest within these societies themselves and against their leaders at the top. Also, in October 1981, I noticed another obscurely placed wire service story from Belgrade about disturbances among ethnic Albanians in the southern Yugoslav province of Kosovo. By the time I was ready to leave Israel, I had saved about a dozen clippings. On my discharge date, after handing in my uniform and kit bag at Bakum, the military processing center outside Tel Aviv, I made the ordinary request to travel abroad, now necessary as I would be eligible for reserve duty. The girl in uniform asked me where I planned to go. I told her Romania. She was a little surprised. Romania was a member of the Warsaw Pact, with close ties to the Palestine Liberation Organization and radical Arab countries. Not many Israelis go there, she remarked. Why? she asked. And at the beginning of winter? I told her I wanted to visit Christian Orthodox monasteries, 
a subject I had written about in books. Call the foreign ministry in Jerusalem for the address and phone number of the Israeli embassy in Romania, in case you have any security-related problems when you're there. She said, in an expressionless monotone, while issuing me the travel permit. She then added that the permit was for Romania only, and that I had no permission from the IDF to travel elsewhere in Eastern Europe, where Israel maintained no embassies. I accepted the conditions, knowing I had no intention of obeying them. However minor the infraction may have been, it was at that moment that I knew I might not be returning to Israel. The next morning, as I boarded an El Al plane for Bucharest, I carefully placed my Israeli passport at the bottom of my carry-on bag. Upon arrival, I would discard my return ticket and produce my American passport and use it to get visas to the other communist countries at their embassies in the Romanian capital. Skilling's book had now given me a vocation, a direction, a fate. To read is to learn about the historical background in which one has grown up by inserting me in Cold War Europe, on and off for the next nine years, skilling more than anyone else, made me fully aware of the era into which I was born. That book made me a foreign correspondent. Even though no one had hired me. Even though no one had hired me. Even though no one had hired me even though no one had